Well, good evening and uh, thank you everyone for joining us tonight and welcome to our Heritage Hour. Um, I know there's lots of options for virtual events these days and we're really grateful that you've chosen to spend your time with us. My name is Dana Thorne and I'm the Curator Supervisor at Lambton Heritage Museum. We are a community museum located near Grand Bend, Ontario. I'll be your moderator tonight for our Heritage Hour presentation, Lambton Calamities. With me tonight are eight representatives from the Heritage Sonia Lambton Museum Network. I'm pleased to welcome heritage professionals from across Lambton County for this digital presentation. This is our fourth Heritage Hour talk that we've done as a group since the COVID-19 pandemic began. If you want to see any of the previous recordings, you can access them online at uh, www.heritagelampton.ca or on the Lambton County Archives YouTube channel. I'll also be recording tonight's presentation. So if you want to watch it again, or you want to share it with family or friends, it will be available online. And we'll be sending out an e-blast with the link to the online um, recording in the next few days. This last year has certainly felt like one long series of calamities. And tonight we're gonna look to our local history to reflect on some of the disasters that have shaken our community since the beginning of the 1900s. Some of the disasters we'll be examining are natural, like the Great Storm of 1913 or the Sarnia Tornado of 1953. Some of the disasters are man-made, like the 1902 Wanstead train wreck or the nitroglycerin explosions in the oil fields. Our museum professionals from museums across Lambton County will share a variety of different events from a variety of different locations. If you have questions during the presentation, please feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen or to type it into the chat. You can also use the chat box to make comments or talk with other attendees. Uh, just be sure you're sending your message to all attendees and not to the panelists or else everybody won't see it. Um, you can start the chat off by sharing where you're watching from tonight. I'm always fascinated to see how far our reach can get outside of Ontario. So let us know where you're from um, and don't hesitate to talk during the presentation. That's one of the nice things about joining us live. And I'll be um, presenting the questions to the panelists once everyone has presented today. I'll be introducing each presenter as we go along. Um, we'll finish with the Q&A as well as some updates from our community museums. I'm really grateful for all the panelists that joined us tonight to share their knowledge and that continue providing great content even while our museums are closed to the public. And if you love the presentation tonight, keep your eyes open to register for our June 17th talk, which is on the lamb in Lambton. Now I will introduce our first speaker. Uh, first off, we have Nicole Asselis, the Archivist Supervisor for the Lambton County Archives, which is located in Wyoming, Ontario. She's been in that position since 2018. Previously, Nicole was the curator of the Museum of Ontario Archaeology in London, Ontario, where she oversaw exhibition development and the management of collections. Nicole holds a Bachelor of Honours in Classical History with a minor in Ancient Languages and continues to be active in archaeology today. She has been part of archaeological excavations in Romania, England, and throughout Southern Ontario. She also holds postgraduate certificate in museum and gallery studies and a professional certificate in creative writing. Thank you for uh, being with us tonight. Nicole, if you'd like to start your presentation. Thank you, Dana. So as I get set up here, let me just share the screen. Uh, this presentation is going to look at the snow emergency from 2010 from the perspective of those who are impacted by the storm. So this slideshow is going to go into an overview of the snow emergency, including excerpts from a few community story submissions that we had during um, a project that we did last year. So to get started, what was the snow emergency? So Snowmageddon, aka the 2010 snow emergency, began on December 12, 2010, and saw an estimated 1,500 people stranded along Highway 402 and on area roadways in snow squall conditions that did not subside until the morning of December 14th. Over the course of the event, residents were rescued by snowmobile, bus, and the Canadian military helicopters. In total, all of those stranded were found to be safe. Approximately 700 of the rescued were housed at one of the 10 local emergency shelters. Still an equal number was estimated to have been sheltered and fed by the generous Lambton County residents. So 
So to kind of start, this is one of the story earlier story submissions that came in. Uh, the person noted, my memories of Snowmageddon probably start on the night of December 13th when I first realized how bad it was really was. Forest OPP asked us if we could make it out to the 402 by snowmobile to aid a stranded motorist. We headed out of town toward the 402 and could barely see. Once we reached Douglas Line and started up the hill on Highway 21, visibility became zero. All I could do was fill the edge of the ditch with my ski until I almost hit a mailbox. We felt we would become stranded ourselves, but would try in the morning with daylight on our side. So Lambton County's warden at the time of this event was Steve Arnold, and he declared a state of emergency, which gave the clear for the military to be called in. Uh, first, they sent the Hercules helicopter from Trenton with the purpose of surveying the extent of the situation and dropping flares. However, when they arrived, the squalls were so dense that um, they could not see, and so they grounded since it was unsafe to continue the flight once visibility uh, once visibility cleared and it was safe, they sent in the Griffin helicopter, which is the rescue helicopter that you see in these images. So another story here, it was about 4 p.m. and we were busy preparing dinner when the cars and trucks started to stop in front of our house. We sat in our warm home eating our dinner. We determined that we needed to do something for all the people that were stuck in their vehicles on the road. It was snowing hard and very cold and windy, but we were able to communicate with a few of them that they were welcome to come to our house if they wanted a warm place to sleep. Snowmageddon was an intense storm that surprised many and took our community by force. It was amazing to see how our military and community gathered all these stranded people in our township. We are very grateful to be able to offer our home as a refuge for those men in their time of need and we'll never forget the few days where strangers became like friends. Another one, I was on my way to an 8 a.m. exam at Lambton College. I had left early to make it in time from London. Traffic was slow. Then as I approached Oil Heritage Road on the 402, I made the decision to try and get off the highway. The off-ramp was blocked by a jackknife tractor trailer, so I continued on the 402 for about a kilometer before traffic came to a standstill. We passed the time by talking, watching movies on my band's DVD player, and chatting on the phone to friends and family. The next morning around 10, some people came around on snowmobiles with water for the people who were stranded. And I will note it wasn't just Lambton County that was hit by the snowstorm, parts of Middlesex and other area counties were hit as well, but definitely the area between Oil Heritage Road and Center Road near Strathroy was one of the worst hit areas of this snowstorm. The next day, the storm had really picked up and was piling snow high everywhere. Transport trucks began lining the streets in town Parking for shelter as the truck stop was now over capacity. Travelers filled the motor or motels in Reese's Corners, and they also started lining the streets in town, some making it to Petrolia. And this is what I found came out of almost every single story submission. Wyoming as a whole was really, really stepped up and showed such generosity, kindness, and small town strength. Never had we seen a small town shine as Wyoming did that during that disaster. Once the storm finally subsided and the snow plows were finally able to clear the highway enough to start clearing the standstill, I began taking busloads of people back to the highway. Whenever we matched a car with the driver, we made sure the car was fully dug out and actually started before we moved on. And that right there was one of the best parts of these stories was the highlight in almost every single story submission, the generosity of the residents who really helped those in need. I think that was a great way to look at this type of storm in uh, this capacity. And yes, there was dogs in the storm and there was dogs stranded in the cars. This was one question I had in a previous uh, presentation of this and they were okay. And they loved actually playing in the snow as I was told by one person. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Um, I think a lot of a lot of us remember that event and uh, the impact that it had um, on our community. And I think, especially now during the pandemic, it's really heartening to hear those stories of our community coming together and supporting each other and remembering that um, there will be times when we will be able to gather again and, and uh, welcome strangers into our home and things will look up. Thanks, Nicole. 
Our next presenters tonight is a husband and wife team representing the Plimpton Wyoming Museum. Bill Monroe volunteers with the Plimpton Wyoming Historical Society. He's on the board of directors and is the chairman of the plaque committee. Bill is a retired electrician with an interest in local history. Jan Monroe is a retired insurance agent. She's been the treasurer of the Plimpton Wyoming Historical Society for the past five years and enjoys geneal genealogical research. And I'm just gonna get their slides up. Give me a second here. Okay, go ahead, uh, Bill and Jen. Okay, <laughs> good, good evening, everyone. The uh, 1902 Wanstead train wreck was the <clears throat> worst disa train disaster in Lampton County. There were 29 fatalities and over 30 injured. The fatalities included an engineer and a fireman who were employed by the Grand Trunk Railway. <clears throat> the Pacific Flyer Number no. 5 passenger train was headed west on the evening of December 26. It consisted of two day coaches and several Pullman cars. Many of the passengers were returning home from holiday visits. It left London about an hour late in a blinding snowstorm and was anxious to make up time. A second train and an eastbound freight was headed for Toronto. It was carrying frozen meat from Chicago to the Toronto markets. The freight train was taking on water at Wyoming, which added a delay of seven to eight minutes. It was given orders to wait at the west siding of Wanstead until the passenger train had passed by. And the freight slowed down so the brakeman could not, uh, slowed down so the brakeman could run ahead and open the switch. Unfortunately, the snow prevented the switch from being thrown open completely over to the siding. The engine went past the siding and this necessitated backing up. Just as they were nearing the switch again, the conductor saw the Pacific Flyer approaching through the storm. <clears throat> Realizing that the flyer could not stop in time, he left the engine and called the engineer and the fireman to do the same. The engineer got one leg over the lever and then the crash occurred. The conductor was struck by a flying lamp. <clears throat> Excuse me. At 10, 10 p.m., the trains collided head on 60 rods west of Wanstead, which is about a thousand feet in today's terms. Both engines landed in the north side of the ditch. The collision caused the baggage car of the passenger car to telescope into the day car. This is where most of the fatalities took place. Passengers in the other day car and the Pullman cars escaped with bruises or being shaken up. The freight train was driven back about two and a half car lengths. A locomotive from the Sarnia Auxiliary Wrecker was the first to arrive at approximately 1 a.m. in the morning. Help from London arrived at about 2.30 a.m. to transport the injured to Victoria Hospital in London. Another train arrived later to take the casualties to London to be identified. Miscommunication between the London dispatcher and the Watford train station agent was a major factor in the disaster, as well as poor visibility from the snowstorm. An inquiry was held three days after the accident at the Wyoming Temperance Hall in an attempt to fix the blame. As one can imagine, though, there was a lot of finger pointing that took place. In the end, a 14 member jury found that the collision was due to wrong orders being given to the Express at Watford, but it could not agree on whom the responsibility rested. During the research into the train crash, newspaper accounts <clears throat> of lives lost varied between 24 and 38. Uh, the PWHS was planning to install a commemorative plaque and we needed an accurate number and the correct spelling of each name. We also followed up on all the injured to verify that they had survived. The final total was 29. Some backstories surfaced during the research that seemed to add an extra layer of sadness to this tragedy. One passenger from Chicago was interviewed in the hospital after the accident. He had come to Canada with the idea of cheering up his brother who was a late captain that had lost his schooner in the fall. The passenger died from his injuries a few days later. Another passenger had been in Kingston to attend her father's funeral. She was returning home to Petrolia when she was killed. Then there was the businessman from Chicago who died in the crash. Two women, both claiming to be his widow, sued the railroad for damages. The company admitted liability, but was unsure which widow to pay. 
It took over four years for the case to be settled. Wife number one received $1,000 and wife number two received $1. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, uh, Jen and Bill. And um, I think we also had this picture of the train uh, disaster to share. That was the, uh, that was the, uh, the Pacific Flyer number five. That was the passenger train locomotive. As well as um, here is a copy of the um, a picture of the commemorative plaque that was erected uh, last year by the Plimpton Wyoming Historical Society. Last October. Yeah, it's great to see those efforts by our local community groups to make sure that these um, great historical events are acknowledged and are remembered um, by everyone in our community. So thank you both for your, for your talk tonight. Um, next up, we're going to hear from Lori Mason. Lori has been the curator of Moore Museum for 35 years. She holds a Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Education degrees um, from Brock University, as well as a certificate in museum studies from the Ontario Museum Association. Moore Museum began in 1975 in the former Moortown School and has grown over the past 45 years to a 13 building community museum, so showcasing the social, agricultural and marine history of the former Moore Township section of St. Clair Township. Lori, if you'd like to share your screen and go ahead with your presentation now. Thanks, Dana. Good evening, everyone. As soon as I figure out the technology, I can get started. There we are. Okay. A ship taking on water, a sudden squall, and a crew in peril was the making of disaster on October 4th, 1869 on Lake Michigan. But the story begins back here in Lambton County in the village of Corona in what was then Moore Township, now part of St. Clair Township. John Bully arrived in Corona around 1860 and soon established a number of commercial enterprises. In the 1864 business directory, he is listed as being a proprietor of a steam sawmill and grist mill. So for a man with varied business interests and living along the St. Clair River, seeing constant traffic of schooners and steamships, it's not too surprising, I suppose, that his attention turned to the idea of building a ship. So he sold his farm in Froomfield and his son Grismel in Corona and bought the property just south of what is now Guthrie Park. And there he built a dock and stocks for the construction of a ship. He had the ship built by shipbuilders at a cost of $18,000. When construction of John Bully's two-masted wooden schooner was completed in 1868, he christened it the Kate Bully in honor of his daughter. The Kate Bully was 144 feet in length and built specifically for the lumber trade. Um, she had hatches built into the stern to enable the loading of long timbers. The Kate Bully's early career brought much success. She established a speed record, making the run from Kingston to the mouth of the Walling Canal in 20 hours, which at the time was a speed record. Success was to be short-lived, however. Her fateful voyage began at Sarnia on September 28th of 1869. She headed out for Chicago, loaded with railway ties and spiles. Aboard were nine crew members and one passenger. The Kate Bully was captained by um, Henry, Henry Leonard McGlashan. Formerly a deep sea sailor, Captain McGlashan was by this time living in Corona and sailing the lakes. The rest of the crew were first mate George Kennedy, second mate Herbert Turcotte of Kingston, John Stone of Froomfield, Seaman Thomas Doran of Kingston, Charles O'Connor of Chicago, Edward Corbett of uh, Five Islands, Nova Scotia, Merritt Bully of Froomfield, who was the owner of John Bully's son, and Mrs. Maria Wilson of Clayton, New York was the cook. The passenger was Elizabeth Mitchell, who was from Moortown. The events of October 4th, 1869 were reported in the Sarnia Observer and Lampton Advertiser in the Friday morning edition of October 15th, 1869 under the title of Disastrous Shipwreck and Loss of Life. On October 4th of 1869, um, the Cape Bully was making her way through rough seas uh, along the eastern side of Lake Michigan. And this lighthouse had been built at um, Big Sable Point, Michigan, just two years prior. And this would have been the last lighthouse that the Cape Bully would have passed on this voyage. It was built originally of brick. The steel cladding was added later. By evening, the schooner was 15 miles off Sleeping Bear Point, Michigan, and she hit strong headwinds. At about 8.30 p.m., 
Captain McGlashan noted that the ship was taking on water. He ordered the crew to begin pushing the deck cargo overboard to lighten the load and also to operate the pumps. Unfortunately, this was not enough and the Cape Bully began sinking into the lake. At about 9 p.m., a sudden squall hit the ship and overturned her. First mate George Kennedy was at the wheel and was thrown overboard immediately. Thomas Doran was likewise lost to the lake. The rest of the crew were able to maintain a hold on the vessel, keeping them afloat. But due to the heavy seas, the sailors attempted to lash themselves to the ship with ropes. Edward Corbett was helping Maria Wilson to hold on to the ship, but his arm was struck and badly injured by the boom. And when he lost his hold, she too was swept away. Captain McGlashan was noted as having offered much encouragement to the crew and the passenger, but as he had not tied himself to the schooner, he, his hold was um, lost and he was lost after about an hour. In this manner, with the frigid waters of the lake washing over them, the remaining crew and the passenger spent 40 hours. Edward Corbett and Merritt Bully died of exposure and their fellow crew members had to remove the ropes and turn their bodies over to the lake. Hope for the remaining survivors arrived late in the afternoon on Wednesday, the, fifth, the sixth, sorry, of October, in the form of the schooner Blackhawk. The Blackhawk took the survivors to Manistee, Michigan. The survivors were crew members Herbert Turcotte, John Stone, and Charles O'Connor, as well as the passenger Elizabeth Mitchell. The Sarn Observer article concluded that calamity has created deep sympathy for the bereaved in this neighborhood, but can only be regarded as one of these dispensations which no human foresight can prevent. And the following photos, um, this is Mrs. McGlashan, um, captain's widow, and uh, on the other side is a picture of the bonnet from her morning clothing, and um, this is the front and back of her cloak from her morning clothing. Um, her morning outfit is included in more museum's collection. So this disaster represented not only the personal losses suffered by the family and friends of the victims, but it marked the end of an enterprise because the Cape Bully remained the only commercial ship ever built at Corona. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lori, for sharing today. Our next speaker tonight is David McLean. David is a retired school teacher, uh, high school teacher who taught for 31 years and is currently a volunteer with the Forest Museum and the Plimpton, Wyoming Museum. He holds an honors BA in history from Huron College and a bachelor of education from Alt House Teachers College. David, you can go ahead and share your screen now for your presentation. Okay, thank you. I hope you can see it there, can you? You're good to go. Good to go. Okay, thank you. Um, just before I get started, one of my colleagues earlier asked me if that image that you see on the screen is one of the tornadoes. No, it is not. However, I do have a surprise later on in the presentation for you. Um, so the subjects of my uh, presentation are the tornadoes end of 1953 and 83. And before I do go further, um, I'd like to acknowledge the two main sources of the images in the presentation, and these are John Roshan, who's quite an extensive collection, if you can find that online, and the Lambton County Archives as well. So starting with the 1953 tornado, the date was May 21st. There have been warnings from meteorologists for days that an emer emerging weather system could produce destructive windstorms in Michigan. And no one could anticipate what was to come. First, at about 4.30 p.m., Smith's Creek and then Port Huron were hit by the tornado, with deadly consequences as two people were killed and several hundred buildings damaged or destroyed. On the Canadian side of the St. Clair, the arrival of the tornado was preceded by a severe thunderstorm with heavy rain and golf ball-sized hail. This leading edge of the storm may have saved lives as motorists and pedestrians in Sarnia quickly headed for cover. <laughs> Nonetheless, at 5.45 p.m., the tornado hit the city, first at Ferry Dock Hill, before cutting a swath through the downtown. And this map that you see on the screen now, uh, which was produced just a, a couple years after the storm, 
uh, shows the swath, uh, the path of the uh, tornado through the city, if you can follow it there. Um, so the next few slides give you an idea as to how hard hit the city was. Some at the time said that the devastation was reminiscent of the bombed out cities of the Second World War. Miraculously, no one in the city was killed by the storm, but some 100 commercial buildings were damaged while 150 homes were impacted. Notable buildings that were destroyed included the old Imperial Theater and the Farmer's Market. So here's the, uh, you can see the roof has collapsed, the walls have collapsed in the old Imperial Theater. And this is the uh, former Sarnia City Market, what was left of it anyway. Now, what is not often remembered about the 1953 tornado is that it continued its devastation in the eastern part of the county, destroying farms and causing one death in Warwick. It was fortunate though that the, the twister had not struck earlier in the day as one of the buildings destroyed was a school just south of Arcona. Known locally as the White Schoolhouse, only one wall of SS number eight was left standing after the storm had passed. What a great tragedy would have befallen the community if school had been in session at the time. All told, there were five deaths in Southern Ontario uh, caused by the 1953 tornado. Now, I just should point out here, sometimes you hear that there was a death in Sarnia. There was. It was um, uh, a lady that was killed in, in uh, Warwick Township. She died the next day in the Sarnia Hospital. So there were five deaths throughout Southern Ontario altogether. Um, and it was believed actually to have been more than just one twister. There may have been as many as six or more twisters that spread the destruction into the province. And last year, a group of extreme weather experts at Western University called the 1953 tornadoes the most violent tornado episode in Canadian history. Okay. And here's some more damage out in Warwick Township. Now to share a personal or uh, more correctly, my mother's connection to the event. Uh, my mother is Pat McLean. And at the time she was a 22 year old um, student nurse living in residence at the Sarnia General Hospital. Uh, so in this photo, you can see her on the right side. This photo was taken about a year later after the event when she was on duty still. But on the evening of May 21st, 1953, she was off duty and in the cafeteria, completely unaware of what was about to happen. When suddenly the drapes on the windows began blowing, she rushed to close the windows and then ran to help wherever in the building she could. What was extremely fortunate, she recalls, is that at the time of the impact, the nursery, located in the corner of the building, hit hardest, was empty. Its windows were blown in, resulting in a mess of broken glass everywhere. Luckily, all the babies, as was the routine at that time of the day, had been placed with their mothers for feeding. Lives would certainly have been lost if they had been in the nursery at the time of the disaster. Uh, the 1983 tornado, okay? So this occurred on May 2nd of that year, and it's most often associated with the damage it did at Reese's Corners, but it also impacted properties from Walpole Island and Sombra through to LaSalle Road and Plimpton and Warwick Townships. Okay, some more images here. This is the Dobbin Farm near Wyoming and the Nichols House at Reese's Corners, what was left of it. So like the 1953 event, the 1983 one reached the F4 level due to the damage caused, totally obliterating homes, tearing the roofs off others, and tossing around large and small vehicles like they were toys. Fortunately, no one was killed, but there were 13 people injured, some seriously. So I was witness to the tornado, and I don't have time to go into all the details, uh, and I volunteered with the cleanup afterward at Reese's Corners and down by Wyoming. Um, so I don't have time for that whole story, but in 1998, on the 15th anniversary of the event, Mark Hyben, a student I was teaching at the time, showed me this photo that you see here of the twister. 
And Mark's brother, Darcy, who lives near me in town here, recently sent me a digital copy of the tornado. The photo was taken by the brother's father, Peter, from their brickyard line farm just south of Forest. The image has never been publicly shared before. Peter snapped it as he and his wife, Sally, who grabbed then one-year-old Darcy, headed for cover. Fortunately, the Hyben's property was mostly spirit of damage, but a neighboring farm owned by the Mackenzie family was devastated. What is especially interesting for me about this photo is that it was taken at about the exact moment I would have seen the tornado from a few kilometers to the south. And here are some photos of the damage that was done to the uh, Mackenzie property next to the uh, Hydens. Mm -hmm. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much, David. And um, we're fortunate that those tornadoes didn't result in more loss of life here in, uh, in Sarnia exactly. Land. So, thank you very much for sharing. Our next presenter tonight is Erin D. Richard. She is the Curator Supervisor for the Oil Museum of Canada. Prior to this, she's worked in a variety of museum roles within Canada and England, including the Guelph Museums, Brant Historical Society, the Royal Collections at Windsor, the British Postal Museum, and Black Creek Pioneer Village. She holds a Master of Museum Studies from the University of Leicester and a BA Honours in History from the University of Guelph. Erin, please go ahead and begin your presentation. Thanks, Dana. Gonna try to share my screen here. <clears throat> All right, so for my part in uh, tonight's talk, I'm not gonna focus too much on a specific Lambton disaster, but rather look more broadly at um, the volatile business of shooting a well, which is what you're um, seeing in this image here. Um, from almost the beginning of the North American oil industry, explosives were employed for what was known as shooting a well, which means to fracture the hard rock deep in the earth to help the flow of the trapped oil within the rock. In the beginning, gunpowder was used. And in 1846, nitroglycerin was first produced by treating the chemical compound glycerol with a mixture of concentrated nitric and sulfuric acids. In the early days, impure nitroglycerin was hard to predict at what conditions would lead to an explosion. And even after they managed to produce it um, at an industrial level, it still remained very sensitive to shock and heat. Uh, did my screen advance? No, it did not. Okay, hang on. This is what it did last time to me. <laughs> so I'm gonna try it this way. Uh, okay, so this was the, so here's an, uh, another two images of uh, shooting a well. So the first torpedo designed for the purpose of shooting a well was developed in 1865 by Civil War um, Colonel Edward Roberts, who got his US patent for his exploding torpedo and started offering his services to oil drillers in Pennsylvania through his company, Roberts Petroleum Torpedo Company. And a side note about Roberts, he charged an exorbitant fee as well as royalties for the increased production um, and was very litigious when it came to people using his patent without permission. So well owners tried to avoid this by hiring illegal shooters who had produced their own nitro torpedoes and worked under the cover of darkness. And this is where the expression moonlighting comes from. Uh, sorry. So here we have uh, uh, the torpedo on, on the, the left there. So how our torpedo worked. It was a long tin can filled with nitroglycerin and lowered into the well. A second tin can called a squib was filled with gravel and a few drops of nitro and a lip fuse. The squib dropped from the ground down into the well and if the shock of the two cans striking one another didn't cause an explosion, then the fuse did. As unstable and dangerous as the use of nitroglycerin was in sh the shooting of a well, it was more efficient than gunpowder 
and it did lead to the increased production of a well. So here we have Richard Isaiah Bradley. He is an oil worker originally from Lambton County working in the United States and he witnessed this technique being used in the Pennsylvania fields to great success. So he brought the idea home with him in 1872. Bradley was uh, shipping the nitroglycerin from Pennsylvania to Canada via the railways. However, when they heard what he was transporting, they refused his cargo. Eventually, Bradley set up his own nitro works, the R.I. Bradley uh, Company, on the outskirts of Petrolia's town center. Despite the dangerousness of the industry, there were a string of nitro works established along with Bradley's. There was the Corey and Sons nitroglycerin works, the Ginter nitro works, and the Pratt and Corey works. Spoiler alert, all were destroyed by explosions at one time or another. In 1885, Corey and Sons works exploded, which sadly killed John Owen and William Huggard. The works exploded again in late 1891, but this time there was no casualties. In 1902, the Ginter Nitro works exploded and one man was killed along with the, um, it maimed a horse. 1907 saw the Pratt and Corey works leveled with Fortunately, no deaths or injuries as it occurred very early in the morning. The image on the left here um, at the bottom says it was a solid brick and cement washrooms stood there. And the image on the right is a factory that was 500 feet away from the magazine that exploded. Newspapers reported that the explosion made a hole that was 30 feet wide and four feet deep. <coughs> Um, the worst of these nitro works explosions happened to Bradley's own company, though, in 1891, and Petrolia hadn't seen such a gruesome tragedy before. In 1886, Bradley's factory was actually visited by delegates of inspectors of, of explosives. And when they heard about the explosion in 1891, they reviewed the report and commented um, this. It's a, a broke down comment, but they said, in this factory, it would be difficult to specify one single precaution which is observed here for the prevention of accident. Under all the circumstances, it may be said that this place continued in existence much longer than might have been reasonably anticipated. Sadly, three workers perished in this explosion. Bradley's brother, Albert Bradley, James Chambers, and Duncan McDermott, Bradley's brother-in-law. Gruesome details were published in local and national newspapers describing the devastation and loss of life. Sarnia Observer's headline read, Bradley's Glycerin Works Blown Up, Three Men Blown to Atoms. And the image of um, this article here is from the Manitoba Free Press. The hole left by this explosion was reported to be about 15 feet deep and 30 feet across, caused by 30 quarts of glycerin. Fracking, fracturing or fracking remains a standard well stimulation practice in the oil and gas industry today, though um, it's not done, it's now done with compressed fluids rather than with explosives. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. And we've definitely seen some um, advancements in health and safety in the workplace since. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> this time. So uh, thank you for sharing. Our uh, next presenter tonight is Kaylin Shepley, the curator at Sombra Museum. Kaylin's been in that position since 2017. Her educational background is in languages and history, and she's currently completing a program in museum studies. Last year, Kaylin co-authored her first children's book based on experiences at Sombra Museum. Uh, Kaylin, you can share your screen now and begin your presentation. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, the people who have helped with this presentation, uh, Lori and Ian Mason, Tamara Langford, Meg Reiner, and the Maritime History of the Great Lakes and Thunder Bay Marine National Sanctuary of Alpena, Michigan, uh, for their research assistance and permission to use photographs and other material. Okay, so I will be talking about the Sterling Bank explosion in Sombra. Um, in my research, I found there were a lot of fires and explosions. We didn't have anything as deadly as some of the other disasters. Um, 
but we will start with this. So the Sterling Bank of Canada building uh, shown was built approximately 18 or 1905 and was occupied by George Logan's tailor shop until the building was sold to the Sterling Bank in 1917. Early in 1920, bank operators moved from the previous location on the south side of King Street, so over here, to the two-story brick building on the northeast corner of King Street, the main intersection in Sombra Village. So there. On Christmas morning, 1920, 63-year-old caretaker Ed Mullins entered the bank to check on the building, as usual. It was while checking the basement that Mr. Mullins made the fateful decision to strike a match to light the gas stove. Unbeknownst to him, there was a leak in the furnace, and Mr. Mullins was blasted up to the first floor by the force of the resulting explosion. The bank building was completely destroyed, leaving a pile of twisted wood, bricks, and glass in its place, as you can see here. Um, Mr. Morgan Dalgetty, who lived a block north of the bank, recalls running from his home and looking in the direction of the sound. He noticed the roof of the Sterling Bank lifted into the air, and as he approached the scene, he saw Ed Mullins wander from the site, dazed and apparently suffering from only minor burns and singed eyebrows, but otherwise completely fine. In the photo on the right, you can see Sandy Campbell's shoe shop with the window blown out. On the left here, the small building. And in the background is the Grand Union Hotel. And uh, in the... On the left side of your photo here, the two-wheeled implement is the village's lone piece of firefighting equipment at the time, a man-pulled chemical pumper. Debris was scattered for dozens of yards around the site. Windows were blown out of the surrounding buildings within a block, including the grocery store directly opposite the bank, pictured here. Notice the debris scattered in the street. Oh, According to the caption on the back of this postcard photo of the Grand Union Hotel, 71 windows were broken out in the explosion. So quite a surprise for any guests staying there on Christmas morning. Uh, the event could have been a complete disaster, but thankfully property damage was the extent of this incident and there were no deaths and very minor injuries. The only surviving piece of the building is today mounted outside of Sombre Museum here. The G.F. Logan block is a cement architectural stone which somehow survived a nine meter fall from the top story of the building. In 1921, the Sterling Bank of Canada was rebuilt at the same location, pictured here on the right. And in 1928, it merged with the Imperial Bank of Commerce and remained in this building until the 1960s. Today, it is the bank hair salon in Zombra Village. Okay, here we have the Tug Frank Moffat explosion. Unlike with the Sterling Bank, this was the town's deadliest disaster. Uh, pictured here, the Frank Moffat is on the right in the stereoscope from Cleveland, Ohio. It is actually docked at the Cleveland shipyard. So it occurred on November 1st, 1885. The Frank Moffat was built in Port Huron in 1869 for James Moffat of James Moffat and Sons. It was a 122 ton tug named for James's daughter, Frances. He was a, it was a workhorse tug having a busy career on the St. Clair River and Great Lakes. Um, it was, the career was uneventful save for a collision uh, in 1883 with the schooner Grace Dormer. Around 2 a.m. on Sunday, November 1st, 1885, this all changed. The tug was hauling four lumber barges down the St. Clair River from Saginaw, Michigan to Buffalo, New York, when it deci decided to pull in at Sombra due to heavy fog. Robert Goodwin, the mate from Port Huron, stepped ashore and made the tug fast. Due to heavy current, Captain Tom Curry decided to ease up on the hawser and rang one bell as a signal for the tug to go ahead. Just as it began moving forward, boom, it exploded violently. The sound of the blast could be heard for 10 miles around. The upper works and decking here were destroyed and the hull was shattered from stem to stern. The tugboat sank immediately at the dock. Tragically, James Ward, first engineer and Will Miller, second engineer, both firemen were killed instantly. James Wiley and Walter Fisher, also firemen, 
were killed instantly as well, and their bodies sunk and were never recovered. Captain Curry suffered bruises and a broken or dislocated leg. Deckhand Andrew Reed was badly scalded, and Robert Goodwin, who had been ashore, was blown over a pile of wood and injured his side. Deckhands James Harry, uh, James Harry Siren and Archie Reed were blasted into the river, but were rescued. Wheelman Frank Furtaw unfortunately received extremely bad burns and scalds and died the next day of his injuries. The lady steward or cook, Maud Bentley, was also blasted into the river. And it was, it was rumored that she had a rather unique experience, that she had been flung so far in the air that her heavy petticoats acted as a parachute. And she landed gracefully in the river and was able to use the parachute as a float. This story was false. Her actual experience included her being sleeping in the back cabin at the time of the blast and she was thrown into the freezing St. Clair River and she sputtered and managed to find some debris to float on and was recovered about a mile downstream. She also survived. In total, five of the 10 victims of the Frank Moffat explosion uh, perished. Uh, the victims had been treated by the doctor at Sombra as best as he could, as well as by local doctors who came down from Port Huron at the news of the blast. Uh, the other uh, tugboats owned by the company, such as the Kate Moffat, uh, were used as ferries for doctors and concerned citizens from Port Huron, where most of the uh, sailors had been from, and they all came to help. Uh, the cause of the explosion was found to be a dry boiler. At uh, first, it had thought that the boil the metal of the boiler had given but um, divers were sent to recover the bodies and found the steel walls of the boiler in the sunken tug to be in good condition the boat cost twenty five thousand dollars to build in 1869 but was valued at only seven dollars seven thousand dollars when it exploded and insured for only five thousand so it's a complete loss for the company in addition to the terrible loss of life most of the tug was able to be removed quickly, but the rest was completely removed in 1886 by the government of Canada. This was Sombra's deadliest disaster. Um, in, 18, in 1885, a year that was particularly de deadly for boats on the Great Lakes, especially for tugboats, as 75 sailors were killed that year, most from fires or explosions on tugs, five of them crew of the Frank Moffat. This slide here shows the dock at Sombra where the Frank Moffat exploded. The photo was taken circa 1915, so it looked a little differently, but the tug was coming from the north, so it would have been coming in he about here where this boat is at the time of the explosion. And here are some select sources. And uh, thank you for listening to our presentation. Thank you, Kaylin, and thanks for that uh, reminder about how dangerous and uh, deadly it can be along uh, the St. Clair River and in Lake Huron. Um, could you stop sharing your screen, please? Thanks very much. Um, our final presenter tonight is Professor Greg Stock. Greg currently teaches history at University College of the North out of Thompson, Manitoba. He grew up in Arcona and has published studies on Arcona, Port Franks, and Twitter. Greg, thanks for joining us, and please uh, go ahead with your presentation. Can you see it? All right. Yes. Thank you. Um, I wanted to talk tonight about the year 1913, um, which was certainly a year of wild weather. And I'm going to start off with the, uh, the spring storm uh, that happened in, uh, on, on East, uh, Good Friday, March 21st, 1913. Um, it was described in the Watford Guide as the equinoctial uh, gale because it happened on the spring equinox. Um, the storm actually began in the, mid the American Midwest and the winds uh, increased in, in velocity and finally hit southern Ontario. The westerly winds began uh, to become quite severe. People woke up in early on the morning of the March 21st in Lambton County were deeply concerned about the wind, but it only seemed to increase. It was a strong and incredibly steady wind uh, that was blowing. According to the Watford Guide Advocate, at 10.45 a.m., the wind gusts seemed to increase dramatically. 
uh, and were measured at about 80 kilometers per hour, and they did not abate. In fact, shortly after 11 a.m., it was said that the winds reached gusts of about 104 kilometers per hour and did not slacken and, in fact, uh, seemed to increase. Householders were deeply concerned. Telephone and nascent hydro lines were snapped and broken down. Barn roofs were flipped off and ripped. Houses and businesses had uh, were um, uh, ro the roofs of businesses and houses were torn off. And it was said many an outhouse went flying. Anything that was not tied down appeared to be uh, uh, become quite dangerous. Fortunately, uh, no one seems to have been seriously injured, as far as I could discover. Although in uh, one of the only photographs I could find in Watford shows the, the wall of the DA Maxwell building came toppling down into the street. Um, it was said, fortunately, most people had taken shelter and so uh, no one was on the street when these things happened. Um, in fact, the, the Watford guide from the following week described a, a, a disaster, a, a vast swath of disasters, um, barns, uh, roofs collapsed, et cetera. And most people in the area had it, at the very least had shingles ripped off their roofs. On their farm just south of Arcona, uh, Colonel and Lorena Dunham were anxious about the intense winds and Colonel went out to the barn to check on the livestock. Uh, this is a painting of the house as it appeared in 1913. His wife was so alarmed at the in growing intensity of the winds and she feared that the barn might topple over. So she sent her then eight year old daughter, Ethel, who is the older daughter pictured in a photo from about 1910, out to the barn to fetch her father to come back to the house. Meanwhile, Ethel's younger five-year-old sister, Cecil, was in the upstairs of the one and a half story house looking out toward the barn. And she watched as her father and sister were literally blown back to the house. In fact, in one particularly strong gust, she saw that her sister was blown off her feet uh, and was sailing and was only holding on to her father's arm. The two literally blew into the house and found refuge. So alarmed was her mother that uh, Cecil's mother, Lorena, called up the stairs and said, demanded her daughter come downstairs. And moments later, the roof of the summer kitchen, pictured at the very end here, peeled off and slammed down onto the back of the roof of the main house. Um, later, in, and, uh, later on, Lorena wrote a letter to her sister-in-law uh, describing how um, her two daughters kept their younger infant brother from uh, who was screaming throughout the entire event, trying to calm him down. Well, she and her husband then tried to preserve the, the uh, newly installed uh, glass window pictured here in the renovated house in, uh, from 1915, that window had been installed. They were pressing cushions against the window, fearful that it would blow in during the storm. Um, the fact ultimately was that the damage was extremely widespread and far reaching. I found references to the fact that a, uh, the roof of the Anglican church in Thedford was ripped off, uh, necessitating them to build an entire new structure. Um, they said that newspaper accounts and oral histories to t uh, talk about the fact that the work of rebuilding continued out throughout much of the spring and summer and into the fall of 1913 as people attempted to pick up the pieces. Oops, sorry, I've gone too far. Now, of course, most people um, have forgotten about the storm of uh, the, the intense winds of March 1913. But of course, many people remember the terrible storm of November 1913. Uh, the Great Lakes, uh, of course, um, the, 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 it was a various um, uh, meteorological phenomenon came into play, creating one of the most terrific and horrendous storms uh, experienced in the Great Lakes Basin. The shipping season, of course, is always dubious in November, and November's weather is hardly ever ideal on the Great Lakes. So a number of cargo and passenger ships were plying the ever colder waters of the Great Lakes, desperate to get in a final run before the shipping season ended uh, for the season. On November the 7th, 1913, there sprang up a storm that would be forever remembered as the Great Storm. The storm broke with unparalleled havoc on the towns and cities of the Great Lakes Basin. Power lines and telegraph lines were downed and the rain, what began as rain, rapidly turned to sleet and then into driving snow. Traffic was halted, trains slowed to a crawl. In Sarnia, the blizzard which paralyzed the city and surrounding countryside remained a hot topic in the news coverage for a week afterward. In the farm just south of Thedford, the white of the White family, uh, an old tin bucket uh, was sitting on the uh, veranda porch or the veranda and fair in a short space of time filled first with rain, then a layer of sleet, and finally a layer of snow. 
Um, the fact ultimately was for those who were braving the ship on uh, the shipping season, those on board mm -hmm. ships up on the Great Lakes, it was a nightmare. Um, the storm, many ships tried to take cover in the early stages of the storm, but when the storm didn't seem to abate, several of the ships decided they would brave it, assuming that the storm would last only a matter of hours. Um, one of the ships that attempted to brave Lake Huron heading north was the Northern Queen, a freight ship, the Northern Queen, which attempted to, had been in Sarnia, attempted to uh, ride out the storm in the St. Clair, but there seemed to be a slight break, so the captain decided to head north. Uh, he struggled past Port Huron, and he got to as far as Sand Beach, Michigan, but the storm, the force of the storm was forcing the ship around, and he was desperately trying to keep his bow pointing into the wind, but complained that the wind seemed to be changing and coming at him from every direction. Um, he then managed to turn the ship around and tried to make a dash back to Sarnia, but he was signaled from a ship further down the lake that this was unwise and it was too dangerous. The identity of that ship has never been established, but it may have been one of the ships that ultimately was destroyed or lost in the disaster. So as he, the embattled ship attempted to make its, uh, tried to just simply keep it, hold its own throughout the, as the waves broke over it. One wave smashed over the aft cabin, flooded the hole, and shortly thereafter, uh, the fires and the boilers were put out and the electrical apparatus on board the ship was completely destroyed. So the ship was um, basically powerless and then the rudder chains parted and it was completely at the mercy of the waves. Um, the crew was completely, and as I can imagine, utterly terrified. Um, they, at dawn on Monday morning, they could make out the shoreline, but it wasn't until 7 a.m. that the ship finally grounded. They had tried to lay, put out their anchors, but the anchors kept dragging and they were terrified that they would be dashed on a sandbank or run aground on a stony point and be broken apart. Um, when the weather, when they finally, with dawn, they were able to realize that they were not far from shore, but they had no, they, they ran aground, but they had no way, it seemed, of getting on shore. Um, there was one boat they managed to finally launch, but the fact ultimately was the waves were so terrible that they felt that it was too dangerous to risk getting on shore. However, they started to realize there were people on shore and they realized that they were at Port Franks. They probably didn't know it was Port Franks at that point, but there was a port. The villagers saw the ship stranded and a group began to throw themselves into action. Mr. Archie Jameson and Mr. Rayburn displayed incredible courage. Um, they managed to light fires, it seems, and the crew began to lower the boat. Uh, they got into the boat. The boat was almost nearly swamped, but the boat finally struggled its way, made their way to shore. The problem was they didn't know how to get the ship back or the boat back to take off the remaining crew members. Uh, and finally, Mr. Jameson and Mr. Rayburn went out into the, the crew on board the ship, threw out a, a, a steel a, a hawser, a line, but it kept being blown out to shore. So Mr. Jameson and Mr. Rayburn displayed incredible courage drove out with horses and then managed to grab a hold of the hawser. Mr. Jameson's fingers were nearly ripped off, but he continued. They managed to secure the line. They then took the boat using, pulling themselves by the hawser, got the rest of the crew off. Just before they went, got back on shore, however, they hit a sandbar. Uh, the crew had to get out of the boat into the shallows, nearly drowned, managed to get the boat unstuck and made it to shore. They were then taken to the Waverly Hotel owned by Lydia Hasselwood, and they were given food, shelter, and blankets. The scale of the disaster soon uh, uh, was very apparent to many people in Port Franks um, because the wreckage and uh, cargo, et cetera, of the wrecked ships began to blow up on the beaches, and most horribly, uh, the bodies of crew members of the less fortunate ships, such as the Wexford and the Regina. One young woman, uh, one young girl who I had uh, the uh, opportunity to talk to in the 1990s, she was four at the time. Her father was asked by the local undertaker to go to the beach with his wagon. Her mother strictly ordered her daughter, do not look out the front window. Of course, being four, being told not to look out the window, she did. And she saw her father's wagon come by uh, with a tarp on it. And she couldn't figure out what was sticking out of the, underneath it. It was piles of frozen bodies that had been washed up on the shore. Uh, at Port Franks. In all, some 200 and some odd sailors were lost in the storm uh, of 1913 uh, on Lake Huron alone, and those on the Northern Queen were particularly fortunate. 
um, the ship was ultimately uh, managed to be refloated and was towed away. But it was a, uh, a devastating, obviously, a disaster. So 1913 was not a banner year for um, good weather in, in, in this region. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Greg. Um, so before we address some of the questions uh, that we got throughout the evening, I'm going to provide a few updates from our community museums across Lansing County. Um, all of our facilities have been closed under the provincial stay-at-home orders, but um, a lot of us have been busy uh, behind the scenes. The three museums operated by the County of Lambton are the Lambton Heritage Museum, the Oil Museum of Canada, and the Lambton County Archives. We've been developing online resources to support learners and share our collections during the shutdown. Lambton Heritage Museum and Oil Museum of Canada are currently offering live sessions when one of our museum educators will zoom into a local classroom and do a live presentation. We've also done these live sessions for local community groups. You can visit our online learning page for more information about the live sessions and also get access to our great virtual programs and virtual tours that we've been developing. Um, Aaron, would you be able to share the link for the online learning page in the chat? If anyone wants to check it out. Thank you. Also, our colleagues at the Judith and Norman Alex Art Gallery have a virtual talk coming up in their Art and Ideas series. This is going to be April 22nd, and the talk is called Enthusiasm and Understanding, Lauren S. Harris and Connections Beyond the Group of Seven. So you can visit their website to register for that talk. Moore Museum has been making historical information available on their website as well. Virtual exhibits are currently available at www.moremuseum.ca. Um, the Villages of Moore and Vanished Villages of Moore Township, as well as Churches of Moore. Histories of the Schools and Former Moore Township are currently in production. If you would like more information, you can contact Moore Museum through the Contact Us page on their website or by calling 519-867-2020. At the Forest Museum, they've been posting a history mystery game on their Facebook page that challenges the followers to identify persons, places, or events from their local history. Um, I've been following it and it's been pretty fun. They will also have some very exciting news to share about the 100 year old movie posters that were discovered on their property a couple of years ago. So stay tuned for that. Somber Museum is still collecting pandemic stories, memories, and artifacts. You can share your stories with Somber Museum at hotmail.com or direct messages to at Somber Museum on social media or send them to the museum by mail. They still have available limited edition signed prints of the Daldian Ferry with the option to have your print framed or hand colored by the artist, Don Christopher. And after many months of hard work, Somber Museum is introducing its first full length color children's storybook called Lights Out, The Adventures of Sam and Grandpa. It was published in December, 2020. Uh, for more details or to order, you can visit sombermuseumshop.square.site. Now I'm going to go through some of the questions that we got during the presentations. And um, if you have anything else that comes to mind, put them in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, my first question is for um, Bill and Jan for the Wanstead Rec. Um, you mentioned that injured people were transported to London. Um, do you know if this would have been by motorized ambulance or by horse-drawn ambulance or how they were transported? <laughs> they were. Uh, there was trains that arrived and uh, were set up to uh, pick up the injured and they took them back on trains uh, to Victoria Hospital. And uh, they uh, you know, arrived uh, we, in the wee hours of the morning and uh, to treat the injured and uh, of course to transport the dead to uh, the uh, undertakers in London. Great, thank you. Um, this is a question for Laurie Mason. Uh, how many lives were lost in the Cape Bully sinking? Sorry, I couldn't remember how to unmute myself. <laughs> there were four survivors, so there were six lives lost in the sinking. And uh, similarly, a question for Kaylin. Um, how many victims with the Frank Moffat tugboat explosion? There were five deaths and uh, several injuries as well. Demo question for Greg after our last presentation. Uh, was the great storm responsible for Front Street in Errol falling into Lake Huron? I'm afraid I can't answer that. I don't know. There's probably some somebody else who would know better than I. We could cast some light on that. Um, 
there's a street that's in Lake Huron now called uh, Front Street. And uh, I believe that was uh, partially uh, greatly impacted by the, uh, the great storm of 1913. And all that's there now is beach. Um, so yeah. Great, thank you, Bill. Um, we also had a comment that there's a plaque commemorating the great storm of 1913 in Point Edward on the hill in front of the water treatment, well, the water treatment plant. It's definitely um, an event that is remembered locally. And um, another comment, I thought there was a storm in 1953 called Hurricane Hazel that affected Sarnia. Is that the same tornado or a different storm at a different time? Okay, I, I can answer that. Um, when I was growing up, I hear stories about the 53 tornado and about Hurricane Hazel. Um, that actually happened the following year, Hurricane Hazel. So that was a separate storm. It, it did, it caused a lot of damage throughout Ontario, a lot of flooding, especially Toronto, I think was, was hard hit. London, actually, I think was hard hit. But no, those are two separate events. Great, thanks, David. Okay. Um, got a couple more here. A, a comment uh, from Eileen, the tornado of 1983 was a wonderful outpouring of community support to clean up the damage, especially on area farms. The Mennonite community from Kitchener area came and helped rebuild some of the barns. Years later, the Lambton County farmers went to help with the tornado cleanup in the Kitchener area. So that's really great to hear about people coming together during these challenging times and supporting each other. Yes, I, I remember that from the 83, I was helped with the cleanup there. And I, I think that was the first time I heard of the Mennonite uh, crews that would go in and help with that. So yeah, that was a very wonderful story in the aftermath. Well, we're a few minutes after eight. So if anyone has a last last minute question, we can, we can take it. Um, Otherwise, uh, on behalf of our Heritage Sony Lambton Museum Network, thank you so much for attending tonight and continuing to support your local museums. Um, even when we can't be open to the public, we're really glad we can still connect with you and share about our local history at this time. Uh, we hope to see you again for our next Heritage Hour, which will be taking place in June. And uh, just one more comment here uh, from Maria. Um, thank you to the panelists in the museum for this initiative. Um, so they recently moved to Sarnia, so they're pleased to have the opportunity to learn about some of the important events of history, important events of history of Sarnia and its surroundings. So that's wonderful. Well, thank everyone so much for being with us tonight. Um, have a wonderful evening, and hopefully the rest of this year is less calamitous than, uh, than the previous year has been. So thank you, and have a, uh, a great night. Yep. Thank you, Dan. Thank you.